Well, good morning. Oh, wow, nothing. Let's try that again. Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Fountain. My name is Joshua Hahn. I am the pastor here. If, if you are new with us this morning, we want to say welcome to you. We're so glad you've chosen to join uh, with us. Hopefully you had a great, great week. I know many of you are still celebrating from the things that happened just last night. And so before we go any further, let's just acknowledge and be grateful for uh, Morristown High School and New Pal. Yes. Both men's teams won the sectional uh, playoff finals, and so they're moving on. And, you know, I love, love, love to hear schools doing well within our communities because when uh, Morristown does well and when New Pal does well and people get fired up about the things that are happening uh, within their lives, they feel good about the communities that they're a part of. And so it's a big, big deal. We recognize that. We celebrate with you today, and we are just grateful. And so uh, what a wonderful, wonderful thing uh, that has taken place place uh, here in our community. Well, you know, let's go ahead and get started this morning, and I want to begin with a, a quote from a, a poem that was written by Sir uh, Isaac Walter back in 1808 in a poem called uh, The Merriam. This was an English poet, and, uh, and he once wrote this. I want to see if you can finish this quote. Many of us, I think, can. And he wrote these words, Oh, what a twisted web we weave when first we practice to deceive. That's right. Oh, what a twisted web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And so the idea of this quote, of course, right, is this idea that sometimes we might say this one little lie, and it leads to another lie, and it leads to another one, and another one. And before long, this web of lies begins to, to take place, and suddenly it begins to kind of infiltrate into our lives, and it begins to, uh, to cause all kinds of damage into the relationships uh, that we have. You know, recently I saw in an article that, uh, that, that to, to tell a lie is much more difficult than telling the truth. Did you know that? Scientists have figured out that it takes a lot more brain power and brain functions in, in order to tell a lie than it does to simply tell the truth. And it made me think about, you know what, maybe that's why sometimes in life uh, those who seem so smart tell us these, these lies and maybe we're just supposed to receive them without questioning. I don't know. But, whatever the case, we all live within this world that is filled with lies. Lies that we speak and lies that are sometimes spoken to us. In fact, we live within a world that is filled with these half-truths. Think with me for just a moment about some of them. First of all, uh, the, our calendar year tells us that we have 365 days, but that's not true every single year, right? Uh, we, on Facebook, we might have 500 friends, but they're not all real friends, right? We go to Subway and we buy a, a foot-long sub, but did you know that that is never a foot long? And some of you are like, yeah, I've, I've checked it. No, it it's, uh, it's never a foot long. So we live within this, uh, this world that's filled with half-truths. And I read an article about, uh, about this. In fact, NPR, several years ago, came out with several things that, uh, that they found that we just kind of live with uh, week to week and within our lives. And I thought I might share a few of them with you. And I want to see if you can spot these lies, okay? See if you can spot these lies or these half-truths. And so here's the first one, a two-by-four. What's the lie about a two-by-four? Not two by four, right? It's actually one and a half inches by three and a half inches. And so it's not really a true two by four. How about peanuts? What's the lie behind peanuts? They're not actually nuts. Uh, the American buffalo is not really a buffalo. It's actually a bison. Yes, very good. We've got some sharp people here this morning, but I knew that. Uh, a koala bear is not really a bear. It's actually a marsupial, yes, very good. A starfish is not really a fish. It's actually a inchoderm. Did you know that? All right. A palm tree. A palm tree is not really a tree. It's actually a form of grass. Did you know that? Very, very interesting. Um, this was, I found this fascinating. Pennies. Did you know that pennies are actually worth more than a cent, even though they're only a, a cent? It actually takes more than a cent to make pennies, and so they're actually worth a little over two cents. No wonder our government has so much trouble with money, right? <laughs> Whole different story, but uh, very fascinating about the pennies. Uh, mountain goats. Mountain goats are not really 
goats, and even the color pink. I don't know if you know this or not, but the color pink isn't actually even a color. It's actually what happens when you have white light and you remove the green elements out of white light, and it's just the leftovers of that. And so it's not actually technically a color. Very, very interesting. And throughout our world, we deal with these things, right? We have lots and lots of these half-truths, and we deal with lots and lots of lies that are given to us, and sometimes on a daily basis. For example, out in society, our news channels, they have something called fake news. Have you heard of that? When a news outlet may tell us a story and tell us that it's true, but we find out that it was just propaganda in order to kind of teach us something, and so it's fake news. We have lies that filtrate and come into our homes, and sometimes that happens in our relationships with one another, right? And so we may speak to our spouse or may speak to our child, and sometimes we have these conversations in which we tell these little half-truths. How was your day? Oh, it was fine. How's, how's things going on in life? Oh, it's fine. How are things at work? Oh, they're fine. These things happen in school, too. There was a very interesting uh, study that was performed by over 70,000 different uh, high school and college-age students who said that they went throughout high school or college that they will lie or cheat if they have to in order to succeed. In fact, in fact, over 50% of high schoolers agreed with this statement that in order to succeed in life, you're going to have to lie or cheat. Hmm. This happens within our homes, it happens within our schools, it happens within work. We lie on our resume in order to get the job. We lie to our boss about how we're late and why we're late. We lie to our uh, employees about uh, what's going on within a particular project and the things that are happening. And on and on and on it goes. And sometimes we refer to all of these as what? Little white lies. Little white lies. Little because they're not really big, right? They're just, just little, little things. They're not really all that big of a deal. White because, ah, they're kind of innocent. And yeah, they're lies. Maybe they're not completely the truth, but they're partially true. And so we don't feel so bad about some of the things that we say. And what happens is, is that those lies that take place within our society and take place in various uh, places in which we operate, we take those lies and we speak those lies and then we bring them into the church. And sometimes we will say those to brothers and sisters in Christ. And I wonder what God has to say about that. I wonder how God feels about that. I wonder what God thinks about our little white lies. Well, this morning, I want us to take a look at a passage of Scripture which is going to speak pretty loud and clear to that idea. And God's going to speak into our heart and mind and help us to understand exactly how he views our little white lies. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me now to the book of Acts, chapter 5. And today we're going to be in verses 1 through 11. And if you'd like to follow along in those black Bibles in front of you, we're going to be on page 913. That's page 913. Also, if you'd like to follow along with us online, you can do so by going to yourfountain.info and clicking on the Learn link. And there you will find today's passage of Scripture along with a way to take notes. And I want to encourage you to take notes about what God speaks to you. You might write them in your Bibles. You might write them in your bulletins. But when God speaks a word to you, and when he begins to speak to you through this morning's passage of Scripture, you need to write down what he is saying to you, all right? And as you turn there and get prepared uh, this morning, let me just quickly remind you of where we are within the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, we watched as Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit does come on the day of Pentecost. And a new community is formed as, as they begin to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter preaches on that day. 3,000 people are saved. Acts chapter 3, the, uh, the disciples begins to operate within these spiritual gifts and begins to perform uh, miracles. And a, and a man who was born lame, uh, a lame beggar, is suddenly healed. And Peter begins to preach and begins to declare the good news of Jesus. Acts chapter 4, uh, we see that Peter and John are arrested and, and suddenly they're thrown into jail. The very next day they stand before the Jewish religious leaders and then they say those powerful words of Acts chapter 4 verse 12. That the name of Jesus, 
Every, every name under heaven on earth, that name of Jesus, there's salvation found in no one else but his name. And so they declare this truth. And because of that, 5,000 people are saved. And so this community begins to be formed, and this community begins to, get to grow and to grow and to grow. And they begin to see the things that they have been given as belonging to one another. And they even begin to sell some of the things that they have and to give those proceeds to those who are poor within the community. And all of this is the backdrop to what is going to happen in Acts chapter 5. And what is going to take place in this story that is referred to as the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And so let's see what happens. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, where Luke writes these words. But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And, and a great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last when the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. All right. Wow. This is a bit of a crazy story, right? It's a uh, strange story. We have this story of this couple and, and who, who seems to be giving and they're kind and they're generous and they're giving money and placing it at the feet of the apostles. And then what happens? It almost makes us look at this story and say, what is going on? How can these things be? I mean, they, this couple brings this money, they place it at the apostles' feet, and then suddenly they lose their lives. You see, this is why I don't like to tithe in church, right? I like my life. I... Uh, no, no, no. Why is God so angry in this moment? Why is God so mad? Why is he so upset? Isn't this just a little white lie? Let's take a look at this story. Let's see what's going on. Let's, let's see if we can figure out why this was so very, very important to address within this early church community. And the first thing I want you to notice is I want you to notice the decision that takes place. Decision that Ananias and Sapphira have made. At the beginning of this story, we're told that Ananias and Sapphira, they go and they sell a piece of property and they come and they bring a portion of it and they lay it before the apostles' feet. Now, why do they do that? Well, if you scan back in your Bibles to chapter 4 and verses 36 and 37, what you'll discover is that a man by the name of Barnabas had sold another piece of property. And when he sold his property, he came and he brought that, that money, the proceeds, and he placed it at the disciples, at the apostles' feet. And so all of that money was placed up, upon uh, at their feet. Now we have Ananias and Sapphira, and they go and they want to do the same. However, they take the proceeds and they want to keep back a portion and pretend as if what's being given to the apostles is all of it. So we need to stop and think about this. I want you to notice the deception. Deception that takes place, because notice what Peter says. It's very, very important. What does Peter say? He says, Ananias. By the way, Ananias, that name means God is gracious. Sapphira means beautiful. Kind of odd names, considering this story, right? But he says, Ananias, how can it be that you have allowed Satan to so fill your heart? You've not lied to 
man, but you've lied to God. Very, very interesting statement. Teaches us several truths, at least two of them. Here's the first, and that is that the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is a, a person. And we need to see that. You can't lie to, uh, to, to anyone who's not, to, to something that's not a person, right? And so we know that the Holy Spirit is the third member of what we call the Trinity. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here is a great text which shows us that when you lie to the Holy Spirit, you're lying to God. The two are one and the same. You can't lie to something that's not a person. So those that would teach that the Holy Spirit is the Holy Ghost, not a ghost. So those who would refer to the Holy Spirit as an impersonal force, like Jehovah's Witnesses, it's not an impersonal force. It's a person, third person of the Trinity. And so we need to see that. You cannot lie to something that is not a person. And so here uh, he says that you've lied. But notice, too, that he says you have lied to the Holy Spirit. And who is he speaking to? Who did he lie directly to? To Peter and the apostles. Stop and think about what that means. What is Peter actually saying in this moment? What is Peter trying to to, to point out? What what is he really saying? What he's saying is, is that when you come before us and you speak something that is untrue, and the Holy Spirit has told me that this is not true, that you are not just lying to a man. You're not just lying to an apostle. You're not not just lying to a, a disciple. You're lying to the spirit of the living God which lives within me. Whoa. Stop and think about what that means. Apply that to your life. That means that every single time you and I come before a brother or a sister in Christ, every man, woman, and child who has been baptized into Christ has received the gift of the Holy Spirit, if we come before them and we speak lies to them, we are speaking lies directly to whom? To the Holy Spirit, to God himself. Whoa. Big, big deal. And that's what what, what he's pointing out. That's what Peter is saying here. You're not lying to man, you're lying to God because God dwells within me and God lives within the the, the apostles. And so this was a major, major deal. I want you to stop and think about that. Take this a little bit further. Think about what that means. Now, Peter and the apostles were leaders in that community. They were leaders within that society. And so they come and they begin to lie and speak against the leaders of this growing community of the church. There's a very interesting story that takes place in the life of David. Many of us are familiar with David and his life. And in the book of Samuel, there are two different verses that take place in which David speaks about how Saul, King Saul at the time, was trying to kill him. And David had two different opportunities to take this man's life. And do you remember what he said? You should write these two verses down, take a look at them later today, but write these down. He essentially says two different times in two different ways, how could I ever come against the Lord's anointed one? How could I ever speak against or come against, how could I ever try to harm this one whom God has put in place? How could I do that? And so when we stop and we think about that, when we think about the life of Peter, Peter is saying in this moment, you're not just coming against me, but you're coming against the ones who God has put in place. And so every single time that you and I speak against a pastor, against an elder, against a director, against a leader within the church, against a brother or sister in Christ who has received the spirit of the living God, we are coming against God's anointed one, God's chosen one, the one whom God has placed in that location, in that role for that time. Do we understand the, the gravity, the weight of that sin. That needs to sit on us a little bit. We need to think about what that really means. It's not just, a, just one little thing. It's not just no big deal. It's not just, oh, well, we didn't tell the, the whole truth. No, no, no. That's not just a little fib. It's not just a little white lie. That is a major, major infraction. That's a time in which you and I are committing treason against our Creator. We're sinning against God by speaking lies to His people. I hope this is clear. I hope that we can see that within this, this text. Because that's why they had to receive the punishment that they did. Every single time. 
you and I sin against our creator, we deserve death. We don't always receive it. God pours out his grace and his love, his forgiveness upon our lives each and every day. Amen? Amen. But we deserve it. We deserve it. So notice the death. Notice what takes place within their lives. After saying these words, uh, Peter says these words, Ananias, he falls, he breathes his last. Sapphira comes in. Peter says what? He says, hey, is it true that you sold this for such and such an amount? And she says, yes. And then he says what? Notice what he says to her. Why would you put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? The Spirit of the Lord, Lord, that, that should resonate. That, that's a statement about Jesus. Why are you testing the Spirit of Jesus? The Spirit of your Lord and your Savior. Why are you speaking lies to the one who dwells within us, your Savior? His Spirit whom he has given to us, why are you doing that? And as a result, she took her last breath and she died. This was a, a sin that was coming into the camp. And God said, this cannot happen. This cannot take place. And so these two individuals had to die as an example, as a warning, as a statement to God's people that as they were coming together and this community is forming, and people are loving one another and they're compassionate and caring uh, towards one another, that this cannot be a part of God's holy people can't be a part of that. Now I want to press pause here and just say something about their death very, very quickly, and that is this, that just because God took their life in this moment, that does not mean he condemned them for all of eternity. We need to recognize that. It's very, very easy to say, oh, God destroyed them. Look, God took their life, and so as a result, they are now uh, being punished and are in hell forever. Whoa, 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 whoa. If we believe that, if we talk about that, if we think in those terms, what we would be saying is that the blood of Christ does not cover that sin that, committed, that they committed and caused them to die. And I don't know about you, but I don't feel comfortable with that statement. The blood of Jesus covers all sins. This is not meant to teach us about, oh, if I tell a lie, God's going to come and destroy me. No, no, no. This is meant to tell us how God views lying and how he views our little white lies. This is an example. This is a warning. This is God saying to his people, do not do this. This is how I view your little white lies. There was an interesting uh, story that came out about a guy by the name of Jerome Curville. He was uh, from France, and he was an investment banker. And apparently he had kind of risen up through the ranks, and so he started uh, in the back rooms, and over a period of several years, he started to work his way up through the company and through the bank, and uh, he started to get involved in the bank's investments, and he became the leading investment uh, banker within this, this high-profile uh, uh, bank in France. The problem is he started getting into investment fraud. And he started to uh, do certain things in order to make these transactions, which en enabled him to, to make lots and lots of money. And one got, led to another, which led to another. And before long, they were getting bigger and bigger and bigger until the point in which he finally was caught. He was in the process of a transaction that was worth $7 billion. More than that entire company was worth, and it equated to about half of the gold and the reserves of the entire country of France. In other words, because of his little white lies, he put his company and his entire country in jeopardy. Here's my point. When you and I lie, we say words that are not true. We don't just put a company or a country into jeopardy. We put the church of Jesus Christ in jeopardy. We put the reputation of Jesus himself in jeopardy. For all those who hear, all those who see, Listen, Jesus Christ did not come into this world to suffer and die on a cross so that you and I might not remove these things from our lives, might not start to live differently. No, no, no. He suffered and died on a cross for your sins and for mine, and he expects his community to be holy. 
expects us to remove these things from our lives. And so we need to see that there is no such thing as a little white lie. And that statement, that phrase cannot be found in our, our vocabulary. No, no, no. Every single word we speak, we're going to be held accountable to, the Bible says. We need to remember that. I want us to stop and think about the words that we speak. What are some of the lessons that we learn from this passage of Scripture? I want to give to you three reasons for why we should not lie. Based upon this story, here's the first one. Lying destroys confidence. It destroys trust. When you and I lie towards each, uh, each other and lie to each other, uh, suddenly we, we can't trust any, each other, right? If I lie to you or you lie to me, we can't trust each other, and suddenly there is no relationship. There can be no relationship when lies starts to come into the, the picture. That's true in our marriages. It's true in our homes. It's true in our relationships with our children, friends, family members, brothers and sisters in Christ. Lying erodes at and it destroys the trust and the confidence that we have with, within our relationships to each other. That's why it's so damaging and so deadly. And when Ananias and Sapphira were, began to, to say these words and lied, that's what was happening. They were, these lies were starting to come into the community, and, was, and God knew this is going to spread like wildfire. And so lying destroys confidence. Second, lying encourages conflict. It encourages us to start to get at odds with one another. And we know that to be true, Right? When you and I can't trust each other, what do we then start to go? We start to question each other's motivations. Wait a minute, wait a minute, why did she say what she said? Wait a minute, why did she do what she did? What, what, what did he uh, mean when he, he wrote that email? What did he mean when he said those words? Well, when he say, said that on Facebook? Well, what was happening there? What's going on? Maybe they're not really my friends. Maybe they don't really care about me. Maybe they don't really love me or my family. Maybe if they don't love me or my family, then I don't love them. And on and on and on it goes. Because we can't trust one another. And suddenly we start to wonder what is behind the words that are being spoken. What are those motivations? The same thing was happening here. God knew that if this begins to become the norm and if this begins to spread, that suddenly that his people would begin to start to look like the world. That could not happen. And so lying destroys our confidence. It, it encourages conflict. But then third... It requires confrontation. It requires punishment. Any time that we see lies, those need to be punished. Parents, if your child lies, they need to be punished. Grandparents, if your child, if your, if your grandson, your granddaughter lies, they need to be punished. If you're here this morning and you're an employer and your employee lies, they need to be punished throughout our society, throughout our world. When people do not say the truth, they need to be punished. And the same thing is true within the local church. When you and I lie to one another, those lies need to be exposed, they need to be revealed, and we need to be able to, to bring those to the front and to say, this cannot happen. Not amongst God's people. Because if this continues, it's going to spread and we're go no longer going to have any relationships with anyone. It threatens to cut us to the core, destroy the foundation of everything. Years and years and years of trust can be wiped out through a series of lies, can they not? We've all seen that happen. We know that is true. And they require punishment. And God had to punish in this, this moment. And so when you and I stop and we think about these truths and we realize what is going on in the life of, of Ananias and Sapphira, we realize that, the, that there is a big, big lie that is sometimes told within our society. And you know what that lie is? That you and I are pretty good people. We're good people. Ah, we're all pretty good people. I mean, lying is just a part of what it means to be human. We, uh, we, we just said a little a couple words that were there. It was fibs, little, little, little uh, half-truths. They were little white lies. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that you and I are selfish, self-seeking, self-centered, 
sinners in the hands of an angry God. That's who we really are. <laughs> That's who we were before we came to know Jesus. And then when we entered into this relationship with him, God wants us to live in a, in a very different way, right? And that's what makes the gospel so beautiful. That's what makes Jesus' death on the cross so important. Because when Jesus hung on that cross, he suffered and died for all of the sins of the world, for your sins and for mine. And he took it upon himself, every single little white lie that you and I would ever speak, he paid for on the cross. He paid for by his blood. And as he hung on that cross, and he declared it is finished. He was paying for your sins and for mine. We've got to remember that. That's why the gospel is so beautiful. That's why it's so important. And that's why it's so needed in our lives and in the lives of, of all that we know. You know, there was an interesting story that, uh, that I read about, about a man by the name of Eddie Roel. He was in high school at the time. And uh, he had a group of friends. And this group of friends, they, uh, they loved to kind of pick on this one young girl. And her name is Christina. And she was kind of gullible. We all know those people. In fact, I'm kind of gullible if you ask my family. But, uh, but, but well, we all know people that are gullible. And so this particular friend of theirs was kind of gullible. And so they were used to kind of telling her things to see where this would go. And so one day, Eddie came to Christina and he said, You know what? I need to tell you something. Something's going on in my life. You, you need to hear about this. I've got to have surgery. In fact, I'm going to have to have my liver removed. And Christina heard that, and she bought it, hook, line, and sinker. And then he thought, well, she'll just go, and she'll talk to somebody, and she'll probably uh, find out that you can't live without a liver, and so uh, it'll, the gag will be up, and it'll be no big deal. Well, she didn't do that. In fact, she handled that very, very differently. And later that day, he went home, and his mother came home, and his mom came, and she was angry. She was upset. And she said, the strangest thing happened to me. I went to the convenience store today, and while I was there, I was about to check out, and I walked up, and I saw this milk jug with your picture on it. And it said, donations for Eddie Roel's surgery. Uh-oh. <laughs> and so she came home, and she spoke to him, and he had to call her. And when he spoke to her, she heard those words. And she realized that this wasn't a funny joke. This was a lie. And she began to cry. And she hung up the phone. He said that from that point forward, things began to change. And that they never ha would have a good relationship ever really again. When they graduated from high school, Two, later, two years later, after graduating from high school, she died in a car accident. And he said he never got a chance to tell her that he was sorry. And to this day, he wishes that he had had that opportunity so that maybe, just maybe, she could say those words to him, you're forgiven. You see, lying isn't funny. It's not cute. It's not a joke. It's destructive, it's damaging, it's hurtful, it's harmful. It threatens to destroy and completely rip apart the relationships that God has brought together. And it threatens to destroy even the church itself. When you and I lie, we put ourselves in line with the father of all lies, Satan himself, the devil, whom Jesus said is the father of all lies, whom Paul said is the God of this age, and when we begin to lie, and when we begin to say these words, we're not speaking for our Heavenly Father. And we're not telling the truth. And so this morning, as we stop and we consider these, these things and this story, as we think about Ananias and Sapphira and the warning that this story really represents, I want us to see how powerful our words can really be and how God views those little white lies. Because little white lies are really big red signs that we all need Jesus. Little white lies are big red signs that need to be covered in the blood 
of Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, God, as we come before you uh, this morning, we just press pause in the midst of this, of this time within um, your word to reflect upon this story. And God, as we examine the story of Ananias and Sapphira, we can see clearly how, how you view lies. And sometimes within our life, God, we speak lies to one another and to people that we know. And when we do, we bring damage to our relationships found all throughout our lives. And so, God, I just pray that you would speak to us, that you would bring conviction into all of our lives. Help us to know how powerful the words are that we speak, and help us to know that when we speak to one another, that we need to speak in truth and in love. And help us to remember this stern warning that you gave to the early church. Help the, 20, the church of the 21st century to, to remember this story and to know, God, how you view lying. God, we love you and we praise you. We know that you did not come into our world so that we would remain the same. And yet day after day we are tempted to say words that are not true. Help us in those moments. Give us your spirit. Holy Spirit, give us the strength and the power to speak boldly and truthfully for you. We love you and we praise you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.